Just as our three-dimensional continuum is the surface of space-time, so are the tachyon wormholes of fourth-dimensional potential the surface of hyperspace. We see that there are three sizes of wormholes. The greater size that is a phi over pi pattern traced out in the tachyon multiverse by the baby universe histories of gravitational singularities stretched out in asymptotes from the black holes in space-time. Next, the medium size within and upon the event horizon of these black holes, connecting the universal histories of alternate dimensions distorted geometrically by the gravitational singularity. Smallest are the temporal singularities of superstring gravitational microwave tachyons, which comprise the subspace shadows of the quantum foam of potential probability wells that unifies the multiple dimensional histories of the universe. To say that all of these are the multiverse is to miss the point of what is the multiverse. It is only a series of wormhole links between tachyon geometrical archetypal concentrations of karma permeating the universe, forming a unified field for all of historical spin over time. The multiverse is the gravitational rotation of the universal singularity. This creates tachyons that emanate in an aura around the universe and are immediately pulled back in by the spiral histories of the gravitational singularities in the centers of black holes where they are either reabsorbed through wormholes at right temporal angles or are reprojected as tachyons through their electromagnetic poles at right spatial angles. The wormholes that move perpendicularly to the history of the universe that are the geometrically fractured multidimensional bubble universes on the inner surface of hyperspace cause the addition of information into the third dimensional continuum observed as universal inflation. This is the aspect of the multiverse in which the microwave gravitational electromagnetic links between the fields of galaxies occur. Therefore, this is the most active aspect of the multiverse and equivalent to the main sequence of the lives of stars for the history of tachyons. This does not mean that the greater and lesser forms of wormholes comprising the unified tachyon field of time, or the multiverse, are in any way less wormholes in and of themselves, or play in any way a less active part in the multiverse. Consider the similarity of the phi over pi histories of gravitational singularities projecting out into the tachyon multiverse outside of the spectrum of photic light of space-time and their similarity to the torus-shaped pressure centers that move around upon the surface of Earth following the convection currents. If we were so inclined, we could even find similarities in the workings of our own physical bodies. All is in all. It has been said that the only way out is through, in reference to initiation. This is, of course, a trap. It is easy enough to walk through it blindfolded, if one uses the force of insight to guide them, seeking only wisdom and being open to the truth. One perspective on ancient mystery cults is that they know such truths as one cannot imagine, having taken millennia to make all the right moves. 
What they claim to represent is Kabbalah itself, a vector of spin throughout the multiversal history of the universal singularity in the form of brotherhood. All this means for an individual is being studious and focused on what you are paying attention to, which makes the New Age look like a paperback novel about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. To say that there may be something more in what is, is like saying that some particular agendas might actually be more important than others. Therefore, what more to it can there be without the boat rocking? A better way to look at it is geometrically, examining the phi over pi spiral as a ubiquitous gnomon. Imagine a sphere with two poles. Now imagine the surface of the imaginary sphere bending inward around the poles until the two tips touch at the center. This is a torus. If you drew a spiral that followed its surface area, it would be a pi spiral outside and a phi spiral inside. This is actually due to the fact that you can trace a phi spiral around the vortex at either pole and the inside surface is made of a circular vortex. However, each of these is a measure of the opposite surface and therefore they are expressed as phi over pi, which in itself looks like a written inversion, but means phi without and pi within as the measurement itself and implies the opposite surfaces. To say that this torus shape, whose surface can be traced as a phi over pi spiral, is ubiquitous, means two things. One particular kind of its particles, the smallest, occupies and comprises all forms of all things, while, also, the phi over pi spiral itself occurs on many further different levels and scales of particles, wells, fields, and behaviors on larger and more complexly structured dimensional levels and scales. The former it does in the form of tachyons. The latter, because it is a gnomon. The torus is the shape of the field of which phi over pi is the wavelength measure. This is the shape taken by a wormhole between two points in space-time through hyperspace. Ironically, this bears striking similarities to the world in which people are always trying to get into each other's heads to greater or lesser extents and degrees, and this is called the innateness in humanity for extrasensory perception. This is represented in the pop culture simulacrum that comprises the weather of the mediated information system. If extrasensory perception, hyperspace wormholes, and the stock market all shared the same Taurus trait, then it would be possible to prove that they were related gnomonically. Accessing the geometrically distorted n-dimensionality of the multiverse is tapping into infinite potential. From this is derived infinite potential energy, infinite potential information, infinite potential referentials, infinite potential light, love, and life. However, since the multiverse is accessed through hyperspace distortions, and these are the obliteration by inversion of karma, that occur as spiral histories, then we may as well be left in the Himalayas to meditate why. It was Nikola Tesla who developed alternating current, which is the inversion between magnetic polarities 
of an electrical wavelength. Imagine this inversion to the nth degree, expressed temporally, until there is neither pole of light nor dark, and all is clear. This is infinite potential energy. It is all around us, waiting only to be liberated. Gravity is free energy. Gravity is the entropic effect on free and bound particles of attraction by faster than entropy light called tachyons. These can be used to create wormholes in space through temporal singularities. Tachyons emanate from the surface of our planet all the time. However, during the day there are also those of the photons of the sun. At night they project out at right angles to the horizon into the flattened electromagnetic field lines in Earth's plasma field. Pure dimension is the liberation of the mind and will such that the mind is like a ship, anchored in its surroundings only by the free will, capable of doing all in its scope that it is capable to wish. The history of its free will is memory. The unconscious is the depth of the sea, the subconscious its surface, and consciousness the air the free soul breathes. This is all merely occurring within the flat land of the three-dimensional continuum, and emotions permeate all of this like metaform shapes floating in the free time of the fourth dimension. This is the cycling of karma through the dimensions, such that memories can be triggered by reminders and the orientations of beings are continuous, despite general relativity. Morality is 180 degrees from immorality, sickness in denial of itself. Now which is sick and which is denial is irrelevant. One will lead you one direction and one will lead you another. Asking questions you can find your way around to answers. What is unknown and what is known are inversions until their essence is understood. As long as one clings to what is known, one cannot comprehend the unknown. What you choose to do is only a matter of time. Geometry is native to dimension, in the same way that phi over pi traces the surface area of the torus. It is the measure of dimension and without it there would be no vector, and no such thing as spin. Geometry is based on lengths. It measures the connections between singularities, or points, in the continuum of quantum information units. It always obeys algebraic axioms that can be calculated and understood, no matter how many distortions and permutations thereof it goes through. These occur in the vicinity of space-time due to gravity. Further out, it is thought, the same concepts and rules apply in the dimension of pure time due to the greater wormholes on the surface of hyperspace, but the exact measures are unknown, lost, or forgotten. The manifestation of the multiverse is probably the eschaton most people are expecting. This is a change of perception that evens out the expansion and contraction of our wills and the influx and co-creation of reality with our mind. Once one has achieved such a state of manifestation, one can manifest themselves historical time tunnel realities through hyperspace. The only difference between hell, earth, and the heaven of man 
is degree of freedom. Of course, since all the angels are said to work for God, their will is bound. However, the spirits of the dead are believed to roam about in heaven freely. The Eschaton is the heaven of man on earth and the coming of the kingdom of God to the people. This is a slowly cycling process that occurs over time. People have been building up the ruins since the last Eschaton, and many have even come to believe that this was like participating in its immunitizing or bringing about, and though they have lived in luxury, they are made to wait like all the rest. Some cults believe that such perception can be induced, and it is true that there is plenty of technology for doing so. However, relying on the use of machines, drugs, or even the body itself is only scratching the surface of the multiverse. The system of the mind is so clung to by the discontinuous thoughts that it is called ego. When our personality connects to itself in memory, it reinforces this. The ultimate extension of the ego, the idea of God as self-actualization, is perpendicular in extent to its surroundings, which is thought to be the heaven of man, or the multiverse. Whenever you aren't watching, the measurement of time pass, or keeping exact, careful, accurate account of its regular passage, you are in the multiverse. This only means going through a temporal singularity and the multiversal history of the gravitational spin of space-time that is hyperspace can be measured as such itself. Therefore, whenever the passage of the moments is unobserved, it is entropically discontinuous in dimension upon fractal and gnomonic geometric structures. This is the shape of hyperspace and the nature of time. This is not a matter of, as Descartes described, the room disappearing from existence after we have left it, or even Schrodinger's cat, but more a matter of the old saying, the watched pot never boils. Therefore, it is not a question of whether or not something exists when we are not observing it, for it is necessary that it does, and that we know of it, for by doing so we can measure it. It is really a matter of the potential entropy increasing while not being bound down together into increasing order by the concentration of consciousness. According to J.I. Jurjeev and Edgar Cayce, there is even more to the history of human consciousness than the genetic manifestations of physical bodies alone. Like the eight circuits of consciousness model of Timothy Leary, they propose that we may experience ourselves in ways that even we don't understand, which are both geometric and emotional. They have all had different expressions for it, but the crux of their difference in assertion from the churches of their day was in saying that this had had a past, which could be remembered by or taught to a being in the present, which denies the religious assertion that the soul is timeless and exists forever from the beginning until the end of eternity, subscribing readily to the mathematician's expression for infinity, the Mobius strip. The soul is the part of the spirit that has not yet transcended beyond time, and in this way is the measure of a line on the surface of the Mobius strip of infinite time that is the free spirit. Even this is only an idea in the mind of God, and an angel of a thought flies upon such wings. Therefore are these geometries emotions felt even by the strings of our personality, even that of a clone. The deists, for example, felt that the universe was a giant machine created by God. 
Such a conclusion as this allows even the possibility of AI equaling human perceptions of life. Because getting into the multiverse means going through a temporal singularity, getting out means going perpendicular to the wormhole tunnel reality time stream due to its distortion to the hyperspace history. This only gets you into either the three-dimensional continuum of another dimensional warping of geometry, or the original, or outside the space-time continuum singularity altogether. I describe the effects on active consciousness as it passes through such dimensional inversions as these elsewhere in this book, it is karmic archetypal spiraling centralizations of tachyons passing through our heads that is the flow of our consciousness and font of inspiration, and thus we are capable, in truth, of reading their histories as they do so, and deducing their origins as well as inducing their future projected trajectories. Doing so moves our center of conscious perpendicular to their histories, and thus outside of time. We are, thus, looking at our spirit rather than our soul. Since there is no physical equivalent of this, as our center of consciousness is not even necessarily manifesting a perpendicular tachyon, only following a path in potential, then this is the difficulty in explaining such fine points to a machine or a blank slate. It is a tongue twister. While the most enlightened mentalities are those of meditation, it is difficult to find suitable conditions to properly clear one's mind from all the distractions of the urban sprawl, the suburbs and farms, and even from the concerns of global commerce that are good and honest responsibilities of any concerned citizen. This is not the only way to maintain clear light. It is also possible, and in fact necessary, to go about the events of survival in one's day-to-day -day life with a clear consciousness that is able to make correct choices about conscience. This has been the lot of man since the hunter-gatherers, and is the cause and effect principle that has affected all manifestations of karma since the beginning of the universe. This clear consciousness is even reduced in the minds of metaphysical legislators to include the histories of this motion in the form of memory and imagination. However, this is only Kabbalah in the primary clear light. Would that it were just someone's dirty little secret, for it is as necessary as entropy in the universe or biological digestion. In this way, we all participate in the immunitizing of the Eshetan, by redistributing entropy. The only thing that withholds infinite potential information from every living being is the martyrdom complex. The more we are self-conscious, the more we are aware of our own eventual death. This is what makes us human, and also what separates us from the worlds of the animals. It is also responsible for the human condition of melancholy that leads to depression and even possibly suicide, a behavior thought to be unique to humanity alone. All other forms of life, whether genetic or merely hollow gnomonic, are devoid of this form of self-loathing and are therefore privy to infinite potential information. Even the damned, we are told, have immortality to reconcile with their fate, and thus come to better terms with their duties in life for their best self-fulfillment than the average person stuck in a dead-end job. Other than the perception of death, there is no need for a concept of time, and therefore all those of God's lovely creations that do not fear death may release their cares of time and in this way live eternally in the multiverse, taking whatever forms suit them, their minds always wandering freely. 
The multiverse is constructed upon the framework of the Akashic Records, which are themselves infinite potential information. Therefore, there is infinite potential for geometric distortion into infinite potential dimensions in the multiverse. In the same way that certain words, phrases, or inflections can convey additional layers or levels of meaning, so may coincidences or synchronicities in the manifest realm. So with the cataloging of information that asymptotically or exponentially approaches infinity, does the set of sums and substances reach a supersaturation of meaning where everything is relative more and more to everything else, such that an a-causal connecting principle such as consciousness, synchronicity, Bell's interconnectedness theorem, or negentropic tachyons, which are all facets of the same fourth dimensional metaphor, is infinitely reducible to a one-step impossible feedback loop connecting or geometrically linking anything anywhere with anything else ever. This type of wisdom seems like it would lead to sensory overload in any person not suited or prepared for it. However, this does not mean that it is not always a fact of reality. It simply surrounds the periphery of our sensory apparatus and neural processing, occurring for most people more or less unconsciously, and only representing itself to them in the memories that feed their dreams as asymptotically archetypal anthropomorphism, dream symbols, sets, or settings. These then bleed through into the person's karmic aura by the right brain's emission of tachyons through the holographic thalamus, manifesting synchronicities to call attention to what it cannot convey to the left brain through dreams or the subconscious alone. This, at least, is one modern theory that accounts for the capacity for three-second conscious precognition and remote viewing in an electromagnetic spectral network. Modern secret societies are little different than the Three Musketeers of Dumas or Hugo's time in monarchical France. Freemasons trace their origins to Jacobin social clubs actually formed by peasants, merchants, and soldiers of such European monarchies, including the French, after the monarchies began to become socially corrupt. The Three Musketeers had a saying, all for one and one for all, that has become essentially synonymous with the fraternal structure of Freemasonic organizations. Like Weishaupt's 1776 Illuminati, these modern men and women advocate liberty, equality, and fraternity, or death, which has set them in opposition to both Catholics and dictatorial or nationalist communists. This remains, however, only the publicly visible side of such types of order, while there is a secret, hidden side to them as well. The slogan of the Novus Ordo Seclorum is Fortune Favors, which is ironically printed on American money, and derives from the ancient Greek saying, Fortune Favors the Bold. There is a secret esoteric doctrine among the inner order, which might be best expressed as all in all is all in one. What this means, or at least what it amounts to, is the realization of the individual's capacity for intelligence. Whatever the Freemasons might believe, it is an established fact that the human being only uses, on average, 10% of the capacity for neural electric kinetics of the brain. This would seem to really bring home the Socratic saying that all wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. When one considers that this saying contains, 
like the Zen koans and the true gnosis, at its perimeters, the full fractal branching of infinite potential information already, then one must only wonder at how little of what can be known is known. The limbs of the astral body extend out through the geometrical distortions to the physics of hyperspace, penetrating, still, only a finite number of surrounding potential, interdimensional wormhole tunnel realities of possibility in the hyperdimensional multiverse. These merely constitute the karma in our aura from which we extrapolate choice and integrate our decisions through third dimensional interactivity in the space-time continuum. There are only as many choices as there is karma, and only as much karma as there is ego. There is only as much ego as there is thought of death and therefore of the passage of time. The ego, as I have already demonstrated, is reducible to an absurdity, that is, the measure of time as an infinitely repeating or looped impossible singularity. When Buddha, Descartes, and others have discussed consciousness as being the basis for reality, this is the essential model they have been describing. A singularity of clear light receded from the surface of space-time, infinitely distorted around the edges of consciousness as the subconscious and unconsciousness outside of which is a world that we perceive through the senses, but without which we know not. Whether this singularity represents a thought, an idea, or a dream in the universal mind is just a drop in the bucket beside the concept that it does not, as one day it will not, even exist at all. Despite the metamorphosis of forms and vessels of incarnation, these remain infinite in the pure potential of the dimension of time, and it is from this that the three dimensions of space arise. Therefore, space-time is full of as many forms as have been caused to come into creation from time. Herein is all of the life, love, and light resplendent in its glory. Consider that you are an ancient philosopher-mathematician, and you have discovered by examination the exponential expansion of vertices in shapes per dimension, and wish to correlate observations regarding time with a fourth-dimensional shape. First, you will notice that there are three ways to represent any three-dimensional shape, and those are first-dimensionally, second-dimensionally, and third-dimensionally. Remember that a hexagon is a second-dimensional representation of the cube, but that there are, in fact, infinite ways to represent the cube two-dimensionally. Four, as soon as you had exhausted the number of angles from which it could be depicted, you could always represent it mathematically. Because of this rule, there are three different three-dimensional shapes that we know of for a hypercube, or the fourth-dimensional equivalent of the cube. Mind you, these are only particular shapes that happen to align in three dimensions, like the hexagon did in 2D, when really there are infinite potential forms of the hypercube that cannot be visualized and exist only as mathematically provable relationships. But then, you could always express it in words. The three third-dimensional shapes the philosopher-mathematician, you, would have had to work with to develop further insight into the fourth dimension at least for a cube, would have been the hypercube at antipode, two cubes together side by side, the nested hypercube, a cube within a cube, 
and the hypercube at standard position, which would have just been a regular cube. Now you are up to date with the origin of the Kab Allah, the body of God, Hebrew for metaphysics. In consideration of the Kabbalah, the number of ten is very important because it is the number of sides showing on the hypercube at antipode. Its significance is identified by the ten corners of the two cubes which become visible when they are depicted two-dimensionally as a pair of hexagons. The hypercube at antipode has one face which is internal to it, which makes eleven, but this face is the combination of the two cubes, and so it is secretively twelve. These numbers were also important, and this face was described in a number of other ways as well. Twelve are the faces of the nested hypercube and six of the standard cube. The first of these became astrology, which was used in divination and the measurement of the passage of time by observation of the movement of the heavens. The second became the I Ching, which was based on eight elemental, three-lined trigrams comprising sixty-four eventual six-lined hexagrams, which was used in divination and the measurement of certain particular cycles of time in the heavens, such as the lunar year of thirteen months and the eleven-year sunspot cycle. There are seventy-two deacons by day and night in the zodiac, and seventy-two divine names in the Shimham Farash. When these are aligned, let it be said thus, when we take a step toward the Eternal, the Eternal takes two steps towards us. As I have described, the tachyons flowing perpendicular to the outside of hyperspace are pulled upward in Tori around the projected spiral histories of gravitational singularities through these and projected in exactly flat electromagnetic field lines in the gas jets of the electromagnetic poles of black holes and that these field lines extend out much farther forming a larger electromagnetic torus around the entire galaxy that connects to the pole of every single star in its galaxy and that these gradually differentially rotate along their ecliptic orbits pulled around these phi over pi galactic electromagnetic field lines. I've also described that this same effect occurs for our own sun and that this causes the gradual fluctuation of the local ecliptic plane in a flat spiral around the sun as the electromagnetic poles of the sun precess. This effect on our sun also causes the precession of Earth's own electromagnetic poles which chases its tail, the gravitational poles, around in the polar precession that causes the precession of the equinoxes and the gradual reorientation of our seasons to the constellations in the heavens that measures the cycle of the ice ages. Because the Earth is 70% water, there will always be ice at both poles. No catastrophe, no matter how great, could ever change that. The only thing that changes from time to time, as the sun orbits the center of the Milky Way, its equatorial ecliptic plane revolves, its electromagnetic field lines wind up, and the Earth's pole processes the great ages, is that the electromagnetic polarity of the heavenly bodies occasionally reverses. The result of this on the Earth is that there is either an ice age in the southern or the northern hemisphere. When there is an ice age in the southern hemisphere, little is different. Antarctica provides a large land mass upon which the water can gradually slow molecularly and divest itself of salt, becoming the vast continental glaciers of ice. Antarctica also has many high altitude hot springs in its geographical terrain and these contribute the flows to the ice sheets as they inch their way out to the sea to break off into bergs over the hundreds and thousands of years. When there is an ice age in the north, 
then one side of the Earth is going to get covered in snow, ice, and finally great sheets of glaciers. It is known that the gravitational pull around which the mass of our planet rotates as it orbits the sun has changed position three times over the past 80,000 years. This has caused either America or greater Asia, that is Russia and particularly Siberia, to become covered in hostile permanent winter conditions over the different ages. In America, this resulted in the great glaciers of the last ice age that covered the face of the northern continent and absorbed worldwide sea levels so low as to expose the Bering Land Bridge between Russia and America. It is probable that the electromagnetic polarity of the heavenly bodies reverses when their electromagnetic ecliptics align with one another, and this implies that all the spheres and bodies of the heavens are an arrangement of wavelengths like music itself with perfect regular rhythms in relation to one another. This would be very angelic indeed, if it were conveniently the case. However, there is no more to it than that. Many of the orbital planes of the heavenly bodies around one another are elliptical, and therefore the time it takes the spherical bodies to move the elliptical orbits is greater in some places and less in others, because the mass of the planet relative to the loci of the ellipse is propelled faster at some points in its orbit and slower in others. Therefore, this does not make them necessarily exactly synchronized with the passage of galactic electromagnetic field lines through their poles relative to their equatorial orientation to a body at the center of their elliptical orbit. This might amount to little more than greater or lesser mass spheres producing or conducting greater or lesser wavelengths of energy. However, since these wavelengths are tachyons, they are flatline at all points, curved into a torus shape by a distortion to the underlying dimensional geometry of space-time itself, and are therefore irrelevant to planetary or stellar mass. Neither should the difference in densities of masses be taken by classical physicists as a differential scale between the sizes of the mass of stars or planets, since tachyons are ubiquitous in temporal potential and are therefore the fundamental substance of all greater matter energy. Therefore, it seems to me that the reversal in electromagnetic polarity of the spherical heavenly bodies occurs as a function of both the factors of the elliptical orbit and the polarity of the next greater scale of body exerting gravitational force. This occurs because the gravitational force is twofold. It must operate at right angles because there must be a force and a body against which that force is being exerted. Both of these are tachyons and at perfect subquantum right angle flatline histories to one another. One has been bent into the electromagnetic torus. The other is the direct gravitational force. These are the dual characteristics of the tachyon in the same way that the electrical and magnetic are the dual functions of the electromagnetic force, or that the electromagnetic force is a lesser measure of the same scale as the weak nuclear force. In this way, each galaxy is a greater tachyon gnomon of all the lesser tachyon gnomons within it, a torus, which is, of course, invisible because it is moving faster than light in the hyperspace temporal singularity of Yalem. This is the same clear light that is in the gravitational singularity at the very center of the black hole at galactic core. The galaxies themselves are the lower dimensional reflections of the temporal pressure systems comprising the weather of the potential time just above the surface of hyperspace. When the electromagnetic poles of the black holes, or the gravitational equators of the galaxies, align, there is an effect that can only be described as equivalent to hypercathexis in the Freudian model of the nervous system. Geometrically, what is happening is that the histories of the gravitational singularities 
that extend outward into the spiral histories of multiversal wormholes are overlapping when the electromagnetic poles of their core black holes align. While there may be no visible event exchanged between them in three dimensions, in four dimensions they are like the overlapping of two pressure centers, generating a massive and complex storm. The result is greater production of tachyons. These combine both the electrical and fluid dynamic components of actual earthly rain. As I have said, though there may be no visible effect, there is a difference in the temporal dimension that might best be explained in terms of the phi cathexis system of the human nervous system described by Freud. As electrochemical induction was passed through a nerve, most would be passed on to the next nerve, where the nerve was connected to a network or series of other nerves. Some of this transduction, which Freud called phi, stayed behind in each nerve and built up. Freud termed this the accumulation of ego, the ability to think, I am. When the ego operated upon the nervous system in which it resided as an ambient electrical charge, it caused hypercathexis between the nerves of the system, such that more electrochemical phi was transported from one nerve cell to the next than was transported to it from the last. Since nerve cells alone, no matter how much electrical activity they have built up, cannot even reproduce themselves as such as the lowest forms of bacteria, it is at least questionable whether Freud's definition for ego would match the qualifications for consciousness defined by observations of life. Imagine the way you would move if you were a large tachyon field made of smaller tachyon quanta or the way an axon connects to a dendrite between nerves, as like an ant hill. The hive sends out individual ants as scouts until they find a food source, and then they form a line, more or less, back and forth between it. If they need to, such as in a disaster, the ants could transport their entire hive community this way, tray binary. However, in basically this way, axons secrete neurotransmitters to either be absorbed by a dendrite or be reabsorbed by the axon, and galaxies emit tachyons to reposition themselves relative to one another. One might say of the universe that galaxies are arranged within it like flowers of stars on tachyon vines. Another beautiful metaphor from the terrestrial bestiary would be the jellyfish, whose body is like the flat disk of a galaxy, but trails long tendrils behind it, just as galactic hubs radiate tachyons. By the gravitational force, galaxies are brought together until the black holes at the cores of their electromagnetic poles align. By the electromagnetic force, the galaxies are made to turn by the other galaxies around them, as the gravitational force pulls them together, for it could only be the electromagnetic temporal singularity, or expanded wormhole, that would pull the electromagnetic poles of the central galactic core black holes in its precession, and these can only occur between the poles of one galaxy with another as the distortions to the surface of space-time that causes the geometric patterns of the filaments and voids. Wormholes follow arcing field lines between the electromagnetic poles of black holes at the cores of galaxies, and these penetrate another dimension of space, occurring only upon the surface and within the event horizon of the black hole at the galaxy's cores itself. To say that they traveled through space-time in any form, even as a quantum shadow such as an emotion or a metaphor, 
would be inaccurate. They travel outside of and beyond the three-dimensional universe above and parallel to the surface of hyperspace, comprising the Tachyon multiverse. However, it is not that this isn't there. It's just that we can't see it. Tachyons are wavelengths so small they are clear, and so we see space in the voids between the filaments as dark and empty. Here would be the breath of the air in which the music of the galaxies is played. Before, I have discussed engrams in the mind, such as memories or lines of inductive or deductive reasoning, but I have not yet described them. They are a form of Kabbalah, or metaform, such as is the hypercube, or tree of life of Moses. Thus, studying these types of reasoning can open up engrams in the mind that induce experiences in sequences, since they are temporal patterns. Engrams are also formed by any type of study, however it is ordinarily only in accordance to the free form of our interest in research that shapes these inquests. Thus, a good compass is the formal system of metaphysics based on the six fundamental questions of reasoning. How, when, where, what, who, and why. Deductive, or how, why, who, what, where, and when. Inductive. Still, such as this can only guide you between poles, such as fact and fiction. These types of poles constitute the parameters of our tunnel realities. Often we see that the pattern we are looking at is mimicked by the pattern of electromagnetic energy in the visual cortex of the brain. This is the basis for the theory of engrams. Each memory, dream experience, idea, or comprehension of perception occurs at many places at once as electromagnetic energy inside the cerebrum. The way in which these are related, it is thought, is holographic, similar to the holographic nature of the function of the thalamus just below the cerebrum. The thalamus projects impulses from multiple nerves to multiple nerves through single nerves simultaneously, thus acting holographically by storing multiple encodings of information on the same amount of electromagnetic impulse as is usually only used to encode a single information encoding. The cerebrum itself, though divided by the hemispheres, the functional sections, the stacking of neuronal columns and the fissures, is also thought to act as a single unified unit in which the information in different nervous tissue occurring at the same time is related as a thought form, memory, dream experience, or idea. What we are seeing here is a hollow mnemonic resonance that also occurs on a lower vibrational, higher dimensional frequency inside the axon dendrite gaps between the neurons in the stacked pillars and columns of the gray matter of the cerebrum. Here, the electric potential in the chemical neurotransmitters of the brain is so infinitesimal on the physical scale that it actually catches tachyons in hyperdimension like an ultra-fine net, filtering them through into greater electrical potential and virtually opening up wormholes inside the mind. These translate into the genetic material of the neurotransmitters that are passed down through reproduction over time, as well as to thoughts in the moment for the minds of the brains themselves. Since this effect is resonant holonomonically, we see the electromagnetic field as occurring at multiple points simultaneously in distant parts of the tissue of the brain. The result of this is the pattern of the brain's electromagnetic waves over time. 
there are several different states of brain waves, including the most regular, alpha, beta, and delta states associated with sleep. These are produced in the thalamus and are thought to have a strong temporally regulatory influence on the monthly hormone production cycle of the hypothalamus in women and the growth cycle hormone production by the pituitary gland of pubescence. Thus, the sum total of our minds over time is not only what we think, but even how our bodies grow. The waveform we are seeing that constitutes the mind in the moment, a hollow mnemonic engram comprised of multiple synchronous electrical events in the brain, is the same thing as the mathematical matrix for spin that I described earlier. The spin of the substance of the fourth dimensional emotional metaphorm is the information that is the mind traced out in the brain as the electromagnetic hollow mnemonic projection of the engram thought form in a neural net. As the spin changes over time, so it traces out the pattern of the brain waves. The Akashic Records are a relatively recently revived concept deriving originally from the ancient Far East. Edgar Cayce, the 20th century psychic, said that he derived his ability to read people's past lives from the Akashic Records. According to Casey, he had learned of the Akashic Records in the same way Madame Blavatsky, the 19th and early 20th century theosophist, had on journeys made to the Orient, in particularly from Tantric Yogic Sanskrit documents. Besides these two, there is no writing on the Akashic Records known to Western society and there are no translations of the Sanskrit documents they claim to have read into English or any other language. The documents themselves have allegedly been lost. Madame Blavatsky was considered a dubious character in her time, as was Edgar Cayce in his, and it is possible that the documents both were referring to were actually nothing more than the works of 19th century Russian novelist J.I. Jurjeev. However, even these contain no mention of the Akashic records per se, and so one is led to wonder how these two independent authorities came to discover the same descriptive terminology for a concept that no one else seemed to share. It may be better to begin the history of this concept a little further back, with Ezekiel's vision of the Ophanim wheels, or even the Old Testament Apocrypha of Enoch, preserved to this day by the Jews of Ethiopia. These are accounts of visions of the heavens, and, in particular, of the mechanisms of their cycles. They differ from the Sumerian Book of Enki, in that they are more calendrical in nature, establishing patterns and cycles for the seasons. With the accounts of these perceptions begins the true recording of the history of the Akashic Records, which were, at the time, only known as the cycles of the heavens. The Egyptians, and later the Christians, would have large-scale descriptions of the components of the heavens and their cycles in great detail. However, both of their calendars were as though frozen in time. The Egyptians set by the alignments of their megaliths to 12,500 years ago, and the Christian Gregorian calendar pivoting around the nominal year zero some 2,000 years ago. Meanwhile, all the faiths the world over have always promoted the idea of an afterlife, and we believe this belief to date back as far as ritualized burial, practiced even by Neanderthals, our early cousin species. Thus, the temporal cycles of the extraterrestrial heavens have become associated by most faiths with the heaven of man, where the spirit goes after the physical body dies. Thus, this could be called the Akashic Records, 
the sum of our histories, that is, the multiverse of all matter energy of the universe over its entire duration, measured as dimensions by the vector of geometry. It amounts to the exact location of any point in history, and insofar as these can be linked together, was the basis for Casey's past life readings. It can therefore be subdivided into constituent sections from the universal singularity through the gravitational singularities, through the galactic bubbles, through all the stars of the galaxies, through any planets of any star, and so on, and so on, through into the categorizing of information units themselves, right down to the smallest tachyon. Doing so creates a perception of the temporal pattern of the heavens, such as described by Enoch. There are also two origins of the Enochian system. One is the calendrical cycle described by the Ethiopian Hebrew prophet Enoch. The other is the system of the heirs described by the 16th century Elizabethan English scryers John Dee and Edward Kelly. The cycle described by Enoch is simple enough. It establishes many of the same calendrical features still in use today such as the twelve months of the year, with both name, sign, and deacon, and the four seasons. One feature of the D and Kelly system is in complete agreement with the elder system in these regards, giving angelic banners to the months and assigning godly names as angelic deacons to each. Beyond this, the D and Kelly scryings provide even greater insights into the temporal workings of our heavens, incorporating extrapolations of the four elemental forces as the four cardinal directional watchtowers at the corners of the universe. The D and Kelly model unwinds the Shemhamfarash of the 72 deacons of 10 days and 10 nights each, three per each of the 12 signs of the zodiac, including three positions for each determined by astrological alignments over an elemental grid. It is a very complex system, giving the names of a host of angels as the arcing intersections of letters within placed upon the grid of this cycle and assigning them into the multiple levels of concentric spheres of the 30 heirs. While neither the names of the months and signs given by Enoch nor the importance of the letters scribed by D and Kelly seems to have held up. The systems with which they measured are still out there today and can still be used to understand the cycles of the heavens and the place of our moment in this universe. Think of the Akashic records as the contraction of the same medium as the Enochian system is the expansion. While the Akashic records provide information from without, the Enochian system derives information from within. Both are merely movement on the geometry of the Kabbalah, which is phi over pi. Therefore, the Akashic records and the Enochian system represent all the same things, the universal singularity, the gravitational singularities, the galactic bubbles, the coiling electromagnetic fields of stars, and so on and so on, down to the sorting of information itself, down to the smallest tachyon. Think of the Akashic records as what is being accessed, and the Enochian system what is used to access them. Whatever demiurge or guiding principle there may be in the universe. The satellite telecommunications system is made by and for humanity. Like Stonehenge, it will stand as testimony to the greatness of the human mind. Its usage, on the other hand, seems to be unanimously agreed upon as contributing more often to human stupidity. This is through no fault of its own, for every ingenious component of these beautiful, 
scientific marvels functions accurately to perform their goal. It is only because of politics between the people on the surface of the earth that these are used in the ways that they are. One type of satellite is the military satellite. These observe and have very strong camera lenses capable of reading license plates on cars. Some of these are the leftover Star Wars satellites from the 1980s that have laser guidance targeting systems for destroying intercontinental ballistic missiles. These were never used and will probably eventually become flotsam. A popular theory among some citizens of America, the country that constructed these types of satellites, is that they contain scalar wave technology. Some evidence for this, as well as its usage, derives from those seeking legal suit against the military and the state for secret projects involving the ongoing use of microwave frequency transmission from satellites for use in mind control. The more popular kind of satellites are those used in telecommunications by large international capitalist corporations such as television, telephone, and internet service providers. These carry all the frequencies of mainstream culture in the airwaves high above the heads of the secured and insulated masses, while outside the ridiculous garbage noise of our culture over the span of history since we first put satellites in space reaches out into the vacuum of the electromagnetic background radiation of the universe, screaming life on planet Earth to all our surrounding neighbors. When you surf the net, when you channel surf, when you turn the radio dial, you are traveling through frequencies broadcast by these beacons. There are also satellites sent up by the various space programs of the nations of the Earth for the purpose of conducting different types of research project and conveying various different types of survey. Some of these look down and monitor such things as the weather, tectonic continental pressures, pollution from population densities, and exotic ecosystems. Others are aimed outward and make measurements of such things as background radiation levels of the universe, a survey of galaxies, or, like the Hubble Space Telescope, send back direct observational data from extraplanetary objects. Some are simply internally motivated, containing biological experiments to be recollected later, or measurement equipment for telling the difference between the time inside the satellite from the time at the launch site for coordination of the alignment of windows. Some are simply time capsules sent up by lucky classes of children. Others contain plutonium. The space shuttle is the vehicle used to deliver many of these satellites into space, while rockets are launched off containing others inside a breakaway shell. The space shuttle is an enormous airplane that is attached to a fuel tank and two jet boosters to propel it beyond Earth's atmosphere faster than the pull of gravity. After the shuttle is outside of the atmosphere, the fuel tank and thrusters break off and become space flotsam. The use of solid fuel rocket propulsion systems, such as are used in the space shuttle boosters, has been common practice since the German Blitzkrieg of England in the 1940s. There is also an international space station in orbit around the Earth, and there are astronauts living inside of it right now, at the very moment I am writing these words. This is merely the newer, collaborative replacement for the Russian space station Mir, which had been in space at least 20 years before it was decommissioned. Currently, the astronauts that live on the station are competing to break one another's records for longest time spent in the microgravity conditions of outer space. Perhaps the primary purpose for the satellite technology in orbit around the Earth is telecommunications. This is the goal to link all members of society to one another through mechanical media. Control of these media may, themselves, be able to fit in the palm of one's hand, 
However, they are becoming increasingly reliant on the satellite telecommunications system. As people demand greater and greater coverage areas for their chosen connectivity to each other, this process is known as globalization, and this is a multicultural and societal pattern that is going on all over the world now. It is an agenda of the United Nations who encourage it to be taught in schools and that it incorporate equal rights for women and minorities. It is the cultural phenomenon of mediated press coverage of international events, more of which is offered with the more expensive services. Meanwhile, the cultural phenomenon equivalent to this is the grossing of the classes of the masses into the aggregate mainstream. This attempts to appeal to people from all walks of life and to sell them further acculturations for their affectations. Its sum and substance is the pop culture simulacrum. In the 1930s, there was a disagreement between the Aryan Germans and the German Jews over the value of the human soul that led to the six billion slaughtered Jews of the Holocaust. This led to the capitalist culture's Cold War with the Communist Soviet Union. The argument of both was the dollar as being a representative simulacrum or symbolic token exchange system of nothing greater than an addictive substance such as a drug. Nowadays, many people have caught on to this idea and are forced to part with their foolish identification of themselves with their money, for the value of a person is not expressed by his or her worth to the economy. This does not mean that the same parties who promoted drugs and money as being relative have not continued to make their insinuations about the constitution of the soul of a person as being relative to some chemical substance or other, because there is little difference between the value of the human soul to the economy and the puff of smoke from a cigarette. People still assert their personal desires on reality few realizing what agendas they might be triggering the furtherance of, even fewer caring that these should benefit their fellow people. This is merely the pop culture simulacrum. It doesn't matter if you are real or not. You are only as important as a number, one out of an unknown amount. The system can be bent as much as it bends you, and to use it is like looking long into the face of the abyss for it is looking just as long into you. The names scribed from the set of D and Kelly's Enochian system are assigned to angels. However, in so far as the manner in which they are interconnected, so are they arranged upon the airs, such that attention should be called to their arcing curvature. Although D was not officially entitled to call these angels, archangels, we are free to call them archetypes. They are not alone as such either, because the trait of their arcing interconnectedness is not a necessary characteristic of archetypes. The patterns described by Dee and Kelly do offer an additional level of insight into the ontology of archetypes. However, we see that the phi over pi spiral is archetypal in itself due to its geometrical ubiquity. Archetypes may not only be angels or even archangels, but they are the geometrical equivalent of the infinite potential free will of the singularity of the spirit raised by enlightenment of the conscious ego. This may be another name for the universal life form, that is, a singularity one-to-one -one with the universal singularity. This is not necessarily a biological life form, though by its inhabitation a physical body could be motivated. This would be the essence of the soul that is equal in heaven to the orders of angels before God. Even the demons of the cliffotic shells are archetypal, though not in their given form. The hierarchy of hell represents an ordered system in which everyone that clings to the side of the pit 
is given duty and knowledge for its conduct. This is merely to say that, like the periodic table, every quantum may be classified according to referentiality and relativity. In this way, the most high and the lowest are called alike the same, and this is essentially the consciousness of entropy. The rule is that the old greatest common factor perpetually becomes the new lowest common denominator, and this leads to the measure of time, the degree of clinging to which determines the gradient between the ideal, temporal, archetypal, and the manifest, probability, quantum, archetypal. Our minds are always perceiving these things around the periphery of consciousness. They come through in synchronicities of manifestation, in the dreams of the subconscious and as unconscious emotions themselves. Another way of expressing them is the metaphor of the neural net of electrical activity in the brain. Plato described the ideal archetypal realm as according to pure geometry, and gave as his example of perfect or ideal forms the five regular solids. These are the only five three-dimensional polyhedra for each of which all the sides are the same shape. These are the tetrahedron, octahedron, and isosahedron of triangles, the cube of squares, and the dodecahedron of pentagons. These he held to be physical forms that transcended the realm of the physical as representing the same purity of concept as algebraic mathematics. On the other hand, he saw all Athenian sculpture, some of the finest in all of history, as being merely representational of national trends, themes, and agendas, without recognizing in it even the geometrical beauty divined by Leonardo da Vinci. Again, it is little wonder Socrates, Plato's own avatar in his writings, willingly ingested the state's hemlock. Similar conclusions have been reached recently by Hebrew rabbis, who found that the shapes of the Hebrew letters might actually be derived from the shape of the horn of the ram. It has long been held that the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, when taken as equivalent to given number sums, are thought to be the structure for equivalencies in meaning upon which the Hebrew language is based. This, it is thought, would make Hebrew writing more ideal. It is probably true that the layer of meaning the Hebrews encrypt in their writings is about equivalent in a rich, resplendent tapestry of beauty and awe as the Muslim illuminated Arabic scrolls. However, it would be a blessing from a bull indeed to call this necessarily valid, accurate, true, or even necessarily ideal, for these are all words that only apply to what can be known in this physical realm and expressed in even these less than ideal ways. Similarly, to anyone who doesn't believe in a geometry, Plato's forms are little more aesthetically pleasing than a good game of baseball or the concept of an ineffable god. Whether we can consider our realm ideal or not is a matter to be legislated exclusively by the free will. However, every day we are forced by circumstance to consider it real, and for the good of our continued physical survival, we do this in the ways that make this reality the most apprehensible possible. Perhaps it is only because of the scarcity of the ideal imagined, due to relativity that it is even valued at all. The ancient Egyptians had an expression for this, the weighing of the soul of the individual at the time of their death against a feather of mayat. Here we see that there is no scarcity, because there is no relativity, because the feather itself is the soul. In this way, man is the measure. The free will manifests its own karma. Time is the spin of karma. We are continually digging our own grave, a quantum tunnel reality with its end forever in the back of our mind. Which is more ideal, the karma which we manifest in our aura 
or the desired result of the end is ultimately irrelevant to the fact that we are who we are and what we are, each individually. The love of life is clinging. The love of light is clinging. The life of love is fleeting. The life of light is fleeting. The light of love is fading. The light of life is fading. We suckle upon sex. We suckle upon drugs. We die for all our hatred. We die for other people's ideals. Our hearts change like the seasons. Everybody is always busy dying. These things that are meant to give life greater meaning are reduced and diminished themselves by their own use and application. King Entropy wins. The ideal of reality is not, as most people would expect from reading the Republic, a perfectly ordered, rigorously enforced governmental construct. It is the ability to manifest what we will that runs perpendicular to the history of our tonal reality. Because this accesses the archetypes of the subconscious and unconscious, this should not be thought of as an affront to the realm of the ideal of time locked in the potential energy of the right hemisphere of the brain. Remember that the archetypes represent the full neural net activity, not only that of the left or right hemisphere. This only seeks to include the contribution of the right hemisphere in the tunnel reality defined by the holonomonic archetypal brainwave metaphor. This allows for the free use of the thalamus to reflect projection external to the self and in this way affect probability on spin and in this way manifest physical reality. The irony of this is that it does not constitute less entropy as does the utopian governmental idea but actually increases it by exponential amounts similar to the pattern of growth of the human population. Manifestation is an affront to the ideal of time itself, however, since it obliterates the concept of it by relativity in the multiverse. Therefore, more potential energy does not mean more time. The liberation of additional energy from the mind could only contribute to the entropic aging of the universe. Therefore, the angels of our better selves may as well be the thought police, since they are only trying to remind us of what we would only have forgotten by going to sleep. In this way, time has its revenge by warping the geometries underlying the hyperdimensional multiverse. It is because of the supremacy of the ideal of time, king entropy, that manifestation is shunned.